We pray these things in Jesus' name and because of him. Amen. We are in Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul's letter to the Romans, and I would invite you and ask you to turn there in your Bibles. We are in Romans chapter 4 in our journey through this chapter as we take our time going through this letter to the Romans. And as you turn to chapter 4, I need to give you a confession. I need to be straight up with you. The chapter 4 of Romans is a challenge for me to preach. I planned it some time ago and planned to come back from summer holidays and dive into Romans chapter 4. And it has been maybe a little more difficult than I expected. Because back in chapter 3, which we did a year or more ago, Paul explained how we are all so desperately in need of being saved by Jesus Christ. And then in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, he goes on to explain how we actually get saved. That God credits righteousness to us by our faith and not by works. If you take a look at chapter 3, verse 22, I'll read it for you. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. And then Romans 3, 28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And I think after verse 22 and verse 28 of chapter 3, we get it. We understand what Paul's trying to say. I am justified, put right with God by faith and not by works. Not the things I do. By faith alone. I'm saved as a pure gift of grace from God. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, took on our humanity. He lived a life of perfect righteousness on this earth, a life of righteousness that none of us could ever manage. Then he sacrificed his sinless life by dying on the cross to take on himself God's wrath that duly deserved to be falling on my shoulders. He took it on his, and then he rose from the ground grave three days later, conquering death and vindicating the success of his mission so that when I put my faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work, not my own works, then God imputes my sins to Jesus Christ and his righteousness to me. That's the story of every Christian and we get it. And then we come to chapter 4. And Paul goes right back to the message, the theme of faith alone, apart from works, as the only way that any of us are ever considered righteous in the eyes of the holy God of heaven. And we think to ourselves at the very beginning of chapter 4, okay, we get it. We, we've heard this before. We, we know this by now. And in the first five verses of chapter 4, he makes the point again, using the life of Abraham, the story of Abraham. So into chapter 4, we, we get more of it and we think, okay, more, one more time for good measure, all right, just in case we forgot chapter 3, that's okay. But that's where the struggle comes in for me. Because our method of going through this letter of Romans is to take it one chapter at a time, and break it down paragraph by paragraph, sometimes even less than a whole paragraph, and we take our time digesting the chapter in bite-sized pieces. There is just so much depth here. We need to take our time. And that's why we take one chapter at a time, then we go away for a while, catch our breath, and come back for the next chapter. But chapter 4 comes along and Paul keeps going on about how we are justified by faith alone apart from any works we do. Makes the point through Abraham's life first and then he goes back to David in verses 6 to 8 of chapter 4 and he makes the point again from the words of this hero of the faith quoting his words from Psalm 32. And now this morning in the text I'm going to read for you he goes back to Abraham again. And this week as I'm preparing even, I was thinking, maybe we should only spend one or two weeks in this chapter because I don't want to risk losing the attention of the people. Believe it or not, I do think about your attention and your attention span. No matter how long I preach, I'm thinking about you. 
We get it. We're saved by faith and not by works. No works. So, so why can't we just spend a week or two in this chapter and then move into chapter 5? Because there's plenty there to unpack. And honestly, there's been a part of me that's been concerned about you losing interest, becoming weary like you have heard it all before, and then tuning out. But then it struck me again that the Bible doesn't contain filler. There are no throwaway words in this book, friend. And the fact that Paul sees fit in this monumental 16-chapter letter to spend multiple chapters going over the subject again and again and again, coming at it from so many different angles, it says to me that this is worth our time. So don't rush through it. And let's make sure that we don't miss all that God has for us. And so all that to say, we're going to continue on in Romans chapter 4, just as we've traveled through the first three chapters of this letter, paragraph by paragraph, trusting in the Lord's good plan and that he has something fresh to say to us week after week after week in this living, active word of his. So all that as introduction, let's dig in. Romans chapter 4, verses 9 to 12 are our text verses for this morning. Romans chapter 4, verse 9 to 12, I will read. Please follow along in your Bibles. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This is the word of the Lord, and may he add his blessing to the reading of it. So here it is again, verse 11. Abraham received the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Righteousness by faith, and again, it's forgivable if you ask why. Why in the most important letter ever written in the history of this world, why does Paul seem to get stuck like an old 33 record with a skip in it going over and over the same message once, twice, three times and more that there is a righteousness from God that he gives to people by faith apart from works. Well, we don't have to guess why. Chapter 3, verses 27 and 28, spell it out. Take a look there again. Romans 3, 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Notice how Paul begins verse 27 of chapter 3. What becomes of our boasting? And I think that's key. Paul keeps coming back over and over again because he knows how easily we fall into the trap of boasting as human beings. For every good that we do, every good that happens to us, our natural bent is always towards pride. We see ourselves as as self-made people. We prize self-made millionaires, athletic stars, self-made people who radiate confidence and exude capability. We want to be like them. Who gets your attention on social media? 
when you're scrolling through X, previously called Twitter, what catches your eye? What makes you stop and read and applaud in your mind? Isn't it the person who can step into a debate and mount a devastating argument in just a handful of words and they end with a, with a mic drop moment, especially when they are speaking on your side of that debate. We value, we applaud, we appreciate people who are able to exert themselves. The people who have the most followers on social media inevitably are the people with the best one-liners who can knock down everybody in their pathway with a sharply turned sentence or two. And that carries over to our religious and our spiritual lives as well. The majority of our people, of the people in the world today, believe that there is a God. They believe that someday we all will stand before him and give account for our lives. And our innate human pride constantly drives us to say, well, I'm not perfect, I know that. I got a lot of room to grow, but, but I'm not that bad. Give me some time, give me time, and I will prove myself. And that's why Paul has to keep coming at this truth from one direction and then another direction and then another direction, keeps coming back to the same thing and saying over and over again in different ways, you are right with God by your faith alone, not by your works, nothing good that you do. He does that because he knows if, if he doesn't, I'm going to keep looking for new ways to work and assert my way to heaven. I will do it, and so will you. And that's so that we can pat ourselves on the back for a job well done. Look at what you got, God. Lucky you. But when having the right standing with the most important person in the universe, namely God, is dependent on a childlike faith, and trust in his mercy rather than on willpower or performance of any kind of good works, then, then boasting is excluded. It doesn't fit. And that's important. Because in the end, this whole universe is all about the glory and the greatness of God, not the greatness of man not our excellence. We were put here on this earth, friend, to enjoy making much of God, not for him to bask in the glory of me. We need to hear that in our culture. It would help you to read some Jonathan Edwards, the end for which God created the world. It will change your life. He makes a great point from Scripture that our purpose is to glorify God and God's purpose is to glorify Himself. And that's for our good, not for our weakness, not for our loss. Because your joy, friend, doesn't, doesn't contain or reside in the fact that you delight in yourself. It grows out of delighting in the sovereign God. John the Baptist was right when he said of Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. Paul was right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, who says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And John Piper puts it well when he says, there is more lasting satisfaction looking up into the Himalayas than looking up into a mirror. He's right, isn't he? Think about it for a minute. What would you rather spend an hour doing? Would you rather spend an hour in Stanley Park, at the beach, on a calm summer evening, watching the orange sun dip below the mountains of Vancouver Island, reflecting its soft colors on a calm ocean, water gently lapping up at your feet on the beach as the tide comes in with, with Salish rock right in front of you, the North Shore mountains climbing the sky to the north of you, the hills of Kitsilino gently falling into the sea in Point Grey to the south of you. Would, you. would you rather stand at the edge of Grand Canyon to take a point another picture, gazing at the earth drop away in front of your feet, gorges and cliffs as far as the eye can see, 
canyon walls dressed in rust red and browns and slate gray and some violets and pinks shatters, um, put in there too with the greenery of sagebrush and cedar trees adding to the breathtaking and ever-changing landscape of the scene. Would you rather gaze at that scene for a day or would you rather stand in front of your mirror in your bathroom and look at yourself for an hour? Which would bring you more delight? Of course you laugh because you know it's true. We were created not to delight in gazing at ourselves. We were created to delight in gazing and savoring the glory of the God of heaven. And we're living in a society today that's dedicated to the opposite idea, the triumph of the self, that you exist to make much of yourself. And if there's a God, then he must exist to make much of you as well. But the gospel, it's about God's work, not ours and that's what Paul is stressing here in chapter 4 of Romans in verse after verse after verse. And that's why we're pushing on, even when it may feel sometimes like we're covering the same ground over and over. The gospel message is radically different than anything you will hear anywhere else in this world. You cast yourself on God, trusting in his mercy alone, and that makes God look big and you look small. So you get the joy and he gets the glory. That's the way he intended it to be. But you're going to hear a message like this nowhere else on this planet. So in verse 9, Paul poses a question that he knows the hearers of this letter being read are probably asking, at least some of them are asking, as the letter is being read, verse 9, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? See, he's been talking about the blessings that come from God to those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 6, take a look there. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Verse 8, blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Blessing, blessing, blessing. And Paul knows that his fellow Jews will generally take for granted that these blessings that David pronounces back in Psalm 32, well, those blessings are for Jews and Jews alone. I mean, their ancestor, Abraham, he's their ancestor. And he's the one God called out of all the people of the earth to enter into a covenant relationship with him. David the psalmist, well, he's another ancestor in the line of Abraham. And the sign of the covenant that God gave to Abraham and that continued along through the generations, including David, down to and including Paul's day, a sign that God commanded every male descendant of Abraham to undergo is circumcision. That's the sign of that covenant, of that promise to Abraham and to David. Circumcision. The cutting off of the flesh from the male sexual organ and yes, that's another reason why I was tempted to hurry through this chapter, since sermons about circumcision don't tend to draw a crowd, especially among men. But turn back to Genesis chapter 17, because this is very important. Genesis chapter 17, first book of the Bible. Let's read about the institution of circumcision. This is a question Paul's readers are asking, and he's answering. What does that have to do with salvation? Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 to 14. I'll read them. Follow along, please. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And here's why Paul feels this is enough of an important issue for him to talk directly about. Because since circumcision was the sign of the covenant, since God himself commanded it there in Genesis 17, well then, it's only natural to come to the conclusion that the prerequisite to receiving the blessings of God's covenant, forgiveness and righteousness, that you don't get either of those unless you are first circumcised and joined to the Jewish people. And over the centuries, the Jewish people recognized the preeminence of Abraham in God's plan for the world. We cannot overestimate the importance of Abraham. Remember when he comes on the scene in the Bible. We've already been through the fall. We've been through Cain killing his brother. We've seen the descent of humanity into great evil until God brings the flood in judgment, rescues Noah and his family. But then there is a descent again with Ham and with Canaan. And then there is the Tower of Babel. The end of chapter 11, the human race is divided up according to different languages in confusion because mankind has tried to gain a climbing pathway to God by their own efforts and not his. God laughs, he confuses the speech, and they all go in different directions. And then Abraham comes on the scene. He's the beginning of God's progressive story of salvation coming through Jesus Christ. Radically important. And so... Paul's fellow Jews understand that importance and they interpret the circumcision that begins with Abraham and continues to be kept generation after generation to their very day. They interpret that mark that guarantees the blessing of life in this present world and in the life to come. They they see that as the sign that everyone needs if they're going to enjoy the blessing of God. Nobody else gets in. The circumcised, and that's it. But Romans 4 verse 3 says, for what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So how was faith counted to him as righteousness? Or to to be even more clear, when was Abraham counted by God to be righteous? It's the same type of question that some people may be struggling with here this morning. We're talking about beginning another series of baptismal classes in the not too distant future. And you've seen baptisms before. You recognize Jesus' commission to his apostles to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know that on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and the crowd is cut to the heart. They ask, what must we do to be saved? Peter says, repent and be baptized. And you're here, you're listening to this message, and you know you have repented of your sins. You have put your trust in Jesus Christ. But when it comes to being baptized, you just don't feel ready yet. I can't even tell you how many people have come to me over the years and said, I know I should get baptized. I know it's God's command in his word. And I'll do it one of these days. But I'm just not ready yet. I don't think I'm spiritually mature enough for baptism. Well, when was Abraham justified in God's sight? 
Did he have to do something to get himself ready first? Well, instead of arguing his opinion, look what Paul does. He goes back to Scripture. In fact, he goes back to the very Abraham story, Genesis chapter 15, 6. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. So God told Abraham to be circumcised, but when was Abraham actually declared righteous by God? Was it after he had proven himself worthy by circumcision or not? Well, I hope you're with me in Genesis. Genesis, to see for yourself the timeline, we want to look back in Genesis. We've read Genesis 17 where God institutes circumcision as the sign of the covenant. But you don't have to be a math whiz to recognize that God institutes circumcision in chapter 17 and he credits Abraham as righteous in chapter 15. And chapter 15 comes before chapter 17. I wasn't great at math, but I can do those numbers. In fact, let's see the timeline unfold. Genesis 15, verses 4 to 6. I'll read and you follow. Genesis 15, verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man, Eleazar, his servant, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him, as righteousness. So God makes an impossible promise to a senior citizen and his barren wife that they will have a child and they will end up with as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. Abraham believes that impossible promise and he's justified by God. And then in the following verses of chapter 15, God cuts a covenant with Abraham. Now, cutting a covenant, if you missed our Abraham series, you may not realize. That was a common practice in the ancient Near East where a powerful king enters into a relationship with a weaker one. The two parties agree to the terms of their relationship and then they pass between pieces of animal carcasses that line the sides of a pathway. It's a solemn declaration because as they walk between those animal pieces, what they are saying is, if I fail to keep my word in this covenant, then may it be to me, may I forfeit my life as these animals have forfeited their lives. May I end up as dead as all of these animals. And of course, in those days, the one most in trouble of ending up dead like that was the weaker of the two parties. But in this covenant between God and Abraham in Genesis 15, it's God himself in a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, God himself alone passes between the pieces. Abraham just watches. And that means that the God of the universe commits himself under the penalty of death to be faithful to to this man with nothing to offer him. That's Genesis 15. Then in Genesis 16, Abraham tries to give God a a helping hand to bring the promise. It's taking too long. He thinks maybe God just needs some help. So he sleeps with his wife's maidservant, Hagar. Ishmael is born. Genesis 16, verse 16. They have a new child. Abraham is 86 years old. And if you know the story, you know that the family is almost blown apart because of Abraham's lack of trust and his scheming. But God graciously keeps the family together. And then comes Genesis 17. Genesis 17, verse 24. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised. So you put the timeline together in chronological order. And Abraham was credited as righteous in God's eyes at least 
14 years before he was circumcised. And in fact, according to Jewish chronology, the circumcision comes 29 years after the promise and justification. You see what that means? Whatever the exact timing is, Abraham is definitely declared to be righteous in God's eyes years before he was a circumcised Jew. Sola fide is not anything new that God or Martin Luther made up. Nothing that Abraham does, nothing that happens to him after he's justified by trusting in God's promise, nothing can add to that justification, including a circumcision. You need to get this. As Sinclair Ferguson puts it, you can never become more justified than you were the moment you became a Christian. You can never be more right with God than you were the very moment you put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because you can never be justified except by the righteousness that Jesus Christ gives to you. To that righteousness, you and I can add nothing. And that's what gives us joy and assurance John Owen understood this principle very well, the famous Puritan preacher, theologian. He said, one of the most important things in the world for a Christian believer is to not try to build into the grounds of his or her acceptance with God anything that the believer does after they have become Christians. So hear this, Christian. If the foundation of your salvation is that you are justified by God's grace alone through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross alone, and if that becomes yours the very moment you trust in Christ, well, then you can't back the dump truck up sometime in the future and dump the load of your own works onto the foundation and try to hammer your works into the already laid and hardened foundation, saying by your efforts, here God, this is why you should accept me. Look at me, look at all my works, look at what I'm doing to earn your love. You can't do that. The concrete's already set. And as long as you and I are living our Christian lives thinking, well, maybe I can just add a little more to fill in any possible gaps, just, just to be sure of my salvation. You think you're adding what you're doing, in fact, is polluting the pure milk of the gospel. And it's understandable. Human nature is always looking for some way to signal virtue. Look at me, look at what I've done. I may not be able to earn my place fully, but at least I can help God's hand out a little bit. But you see how ridiculous that is. What can I do to help the sovereign God fulfill his promise in history? What can I do to help the incarnate Son of God on that bloody cross working out his eternal plan of salvation? What do I have to offer? And right now, some of you are thinking, amen, amen, wondering at the gracious love of God. But in others, other minds here... Some people are thinking if, if people believe that they can't add a single thing to their righteousness in the sight of God, isn't that dangerous? Doesn't that mean that they will end up living however they want to? What does it matter how I live if I'm already as justified before God by faith as any time in the future? And to that I say... If you think that years of faithful living, if you think that following the Ten Commandments for decades or unfailingly abiding by the golden rule, if you think that any of that can add one gram of righteousness to what God credited to you when you first put your trust in Jesus Christ, then whatever you've come to believe, it, it, it's not the gospel, friend. It's not the Christian gospel. 
And you know how I can be so confident in saying that? Because Paul constantly faced the exact same objection to his preaching. And we're going to see him take that objection on more and more as this letter goes on. But for now, just recognize how much time he's spending here in chapters 3 and 4, emphasizing that our righteousness is gift of God, pure gift, credited to our account at the moment of faith before circumcision or any good deed. So then, another question Paul anticipates. The next logical question, well, if Abraham was counted righteous before his circumcision, if his act of obedience didn't add a thing to his standing before God, then does that mean his circumcision was pointless? It had no value? To translate this into the context that we're living in this morning, Does that mean that nothing I do in obedience to God's word matters? I'm saved by faith alone, no works. If I'm every bit as justified at the moment of salvation as I am at the end of my life of discipleship, does that mean that nothing I do in obedience to God's word makes a difference? The Bible's full of instructions, the Ten Commandments, Jesus' teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, for example, Paul's letters. So much of these letters are concerned with how to live as Christians. If I can't add a single thing to my standing before God, then do none of my choices matter? To borrow a phrase from 1 Corinthians 15, should we, as Christians, justify the moment we put our trust in Jesus Christ, should we then eat, drink, and be merry? For tomorrow we stand before God in perfect righteousness. So do what we want. Party on. But that's not the gospel either, see. And there is something tragic that breaks my heart when I see people in our day who go by the name Christian, sometimes entire churches and denominations, and they look no different from the surrounding world. They decide on their practices. They decide on who qualifies for ministry, who qualifies for membership, what their stance should be in the latest social issues of the day. They decide their beliefs not by sitting humbly under the unchanging word of God and applying it in their day, but they take their cue and their marching orders from the shifting tides of an unbelieving world out there, a world that isn't righteous and a world that in fact hates the gospel of Jesus Christ. Breaks my heart and friend the gospel is meant to transform and bring wholeness to broken lives not to applaud people as they wallow in that brokenness. Well in verse 11 Paul brings out the proper place of works in the life of every Christian. Circumcision, every other work, this is where they fit. He specifically names circumcision, but put every other good deed you do in place of that word. Verse 11, the first half of the verse. He received, that is Abraham, received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. See what he's saying about the place of good works? God makes the promise. The helpless human trusts God to do the impossible. God credits that childlike trust as righteousness. And Paul uses two words to describe what Abraham's circumcision meant to him and what our works of obedience mean today. Verse 11 again. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. First word, sign. Second word there, seal. You see them both there. In other words, your works, circumcision, your works of obedience as a Christian, they are the visible authentication of the invisible transformation that has already taken place in your life. Don't miss this, Christian. This is critically important if you want to understand where your good morals and your biblical obedience fit into your Christian life. 
your acts of obedience to God's word today, they're not the foundation of your justification with God. They are the sign that God has already justified you, that the righteousness of Jesus Christ has already been imputed to you by faith alone, a righteousness that you had before you had done a single good deed ever. There are no good deeds that don't come from faith. As the Bible says, whatever is not of faith is of sin. And that means for us, friend, that if the gospel, the good news message is that you get right with God by faith apart from works, then the implication of that is You don't do good works to get right with him. You have to get right with him before you can do any works that are good. Hear me carefully, friend. The very first truly good thing you ever did in your life, you didn't do it until God had declared you righteous. The very first thing you did in your life that was truly good, you did it as a Christian, not to become a Christian. Now before that, well, you may have been concerned about ethics and morality. You may have talked about the importance of kindness and fairness. You may have helped little old ladies to cross busy streets. You may have changed your Facebook profile to show your solidarity with every trending new cause. You may have helped in a soup kitchen. You may have given the shirt off your back to a homeless person. But without Christ, without worship, everything you did, no matter how outwardly good it seemed, it was all done in rebellion against God himself. And it came out of an unbelieving rebel heart. You may have been a fountain that brought water to thirsty people by your good deeds But if the fountain isn't plumbed into God in worship, then that water's contaminated. As Isaiah said in Isaiah 64, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Not our our bad deeds, our righteous deeds are as filthy rags outside of Christ. So what about obedience? What about circumcision if you're a Jew? Paul says it's a sign It's a seal. Oh yes, we do need to become more like Jesus. He calls us to obey. Paul says right here in this letter in chapter 1, verse 5, that we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Obedience is important, but that obedience is an authentication that this tree is really good. Well, Paul says he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Let me try to explain this with an illustration that's very relevant in our church these days. This is wedding season. It seems like for the last year or two, there have been wedding after wedding after wedding after wedding. Well, let's think about obedience as an engagement ring, especially as we consider this big wedding coming up this weekend, Joey and Sydney making their vows to each other. We're looking forward to that. Well, let's think about obedience as an engagement ring. Since we've seen numerous brides now in this church family, flashing the dazzling rocks on their engagement rings that they put on the appropriate finger. And of course, as soon as everyone sees this woman with this new ring on her finger, all the ladies want to move in close and get a really good look up close and personal. And the guys, well, they want to know how much the ring costs so that they can know that the standard that they're going to be expected to keep when it's their turn. And of course, in the giddy conversations, some of the first questions asked of the ring-wearing woman inevitably are questions along these lines. When did he ask you? What was the setting? What was it like when he proposed? Of course, we don't have to ask them anymore since everybody puts the pictures up on on social media. 
But now imagine the woman answered those questions. What was it like? Where, where were you when he proposed? What if she said, well, actually, uh, he hasn't asked me yet. In fact, uh, we're not officially dating even. I was just hoping that if I bought the ring and spent a lot of money on it, then he would get the idea of how much I like him and he would decide to ask to marry me. And I know that some of you ladies were tempted to do that when the time kept passing and the guy wasn't getting the hint to ask. You were still waiting. You were tempted to buy your own ring maybe. It's very good that you didn't because that wouldn't be okay because the ring doesn't create the relationship. It's a sign of the relationship that already exists, the love that is there already. It seals the proposal that has already been made and is a sign to everyone that you're already, already spoken for. The relationship is authenticated. And when it comes to circumcision for Abraham or his physical descendants, or when it comes to our works of obedience, Paul's making sure that we f build on the right foundation. It's not an effort to get, but the overflow of a joy already known, given by grace, righteousness, by faith. Circumcision was the sign made in the flesh so that as a physical descendant of Abraham, no matter where you were, no matter what you were doing, you always carried around with you that you are set apart for God. You belong to the God of heaven. And as a spiritual descendant of Abraham by faith, which is what we all are as Christians, it means for us that, that I have read God's word and I follow him in obedience because he has already saved me. His Holy Spirit has taken up residence within me. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 1 really quickly. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. This is what Paul writes to the Ephesians. In him, verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So see where obedience fits into your Christian life, friend. See where your good works fit. I obey God as a Christian because he has made me new. And now because his Holy Spirit is dwelling within me, it's my joy to live for him. I don't carry my obedience on my shoulders as a burdensome, heavy backpack. I obey him in freedom and delight because I know that I'm already secure in his gracious grip of love. Now, this past spring, some dear friends planted a garden in our backyard and I just love through the summertime sitting out in the backyard for my morning coffee gazing on the flowers there the beauty of the different colors and I can't help but notice as I watch those flowers that I never see them straining to produce petals the day after day they radiate in beauty we also have two Asian pear trees in our backyard. They've been there for years, and there is absolutely no human reason why they should produce anything since I don't take care of them at all. And yet year after year, in the spring, out come the buds. And then in the place of the buds, there come these hard little round pebbles they grow into marble size and then slowly and slowly but surely and surely they over the course of the summer get bigger and bigger they change color as they ripen until finally at the end of the summer there is golden ripe juicy fruit hanging all over the branches of that tree 
And I have watched them over the course of years. I have yet to see a single piece of fruit straining to get ripe, working out or drinking protein shakes to get big and strong. The apples grow. They grow naturally just by remaining in the life-nourishing tree. You see the connection with your Christian life? John Calvin, the great reformer, argued that by his death and resurrection, Christ gained for his people not one gift, but two gifts of God's grace. He purchased for us justification and sanctification. It's a two-in-one deal, friend. Your growth in holiness and obedience is nothing less than a gift that was bought for you and given to you by God himself. I believe he's right. Makes all the difference in the world for your life as a Christian too because there is no other way for you to live for God with holy joy in the midst of this world and this life but by making much of Him in holy delight. I close with a reference to one of our great hymns of the faith written centuries ago by Charles Wesley. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. It makes a great theological point in one of the verses. It talks about Christ and how he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Such truth packed into that verse. What he's saying is very much in the line with what Paul's saying here in Romans chapter 4, that we do not break the power of sin first and then hope that God's going to cancel it. That would only destroy justification by faith alone, and it would consign every last one of us to a life of miserable slavery, toiling and toiling, trying to get the job done, never able to be sure that we had done enough yet. No, Wesley got it right. First, God cancels the sin by imputing to me the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Then he breaks the power of that canceled sin. So first justification, and then on the basis of that justification comes sanctification. We've got more and more and more holy as we follow him more and more in joyful obedience. Paul wants us to get this, friends, so that we can truly glorify God and fully enjoy him forever. And that's why we can also sing with Wesley, Jesus the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and health and peace. Because we're saved by faith alone. And then we do our obedience as joyful sign of belonging to the justifying Savior. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that though written in a very different context, at a very different time, in a different corner of the world, it speaks every bit as relevantly to us today as it did then. Lord, you have saved us by your grace as pure gift so that our pride could be stopped once and for all, so that your glory could be seen, and so that we could have the joy of not looking at ourselves in a mirror, but gazing on the wonderful cross on which the Prince of Glory died. And now we can say, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride and simply follow you in humble joy. Oh Lord, have your way with us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Team, would you come and lead us in a closing song?